this wonderful special program of course the 2022 national budget overview and of course we get to interact with different stakeholders just to get an overview on what they expect from the 2022 national budget yet to be presented by uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Dr. Musoko Twani. Of course, uh, as earlier mentioned, the budget was supposed to be presented today on Friday, but uh, to the look of things, the budget presentation might be moved to next week, Friday. And of course, according to the law, of course, after opening of parliament, there's a two weeks lapse that the budget is supposed to be presented uh, to parliament, to the August House, of course. As we are with, uh, in regards to the budget, of course, I'll be having a series of conversations with different stakeholders just to get their overview and their standpoint as, as we look at the expectation and recommendation in regards to the budget. Today in the studio, of course, I'm privileged to be joined by Henry Mulea, of course, uh, Vice President for pa uh, Patriots for Economic Progress, PEP. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Yes. And of course, I have uh, Mwenya Yambayamba. Thank you so much for coming to the program. Thank you so much for having me, sir. Of course, Mwenya Yambayamba is a project coordinator for Barefit. Uh, just before we start in the conversation, uh, maybe uh, you just explain to us uh, a bit about uh, Barefit. What, what does Barefit usually, um, what kind of activities do you uh, operate under? Okay, so it's Barefit Theatre okay. Organization. So uh, we use theatre as a tool to engage with uh, young people and children in the various communities that we work from. So as a theatre organisation, we engage with young people uh, for their soul purpose to respond to their plight, because our focus is vulnerability. So, and uh, at the beginning when Bayfield started, we were focusing on the children living on the streets. But as we grew, we um, we also grew interest in, in the ones that are at risk of going to the streets, which is the ones that are in the communities, which are the vulnerable communities. And as we grew again, we just realized we needed to reach out to as many young people that are vulnerable. And these are um, migrants and um, also youths uh, with disabilities. So those are the young people that we focus on and those are the young people that we engage with. Mm. Mr. Mleya, of course I know you are a politician, and uh, as far as we have to look into it, it's everything that has to do with the national uh, interest, of course. Yes. Today we have a conversation of the budget, and I know as a party, you contested in the, the, the just-ended general election, and uh, of, of course you highly had uh, the insight to say you will win as a party, and you had plans that you wanted to lay down as a party. Now, as we are waiting for the 2022 national budget to be presented, what are some of the things that you expect in the new government maybe to look into as they plan their national budget? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, indeed, we went into these elections and uh, hoping that we can uh, uh, rule this country. And uh, one of the key distinguishing factors about our party is that uh, we are the only opposition political party that prepares alternative national budgets. So even as we discuss this topic, uh, we are already uh, prepare, preparing an alternative budget for 2022. And uh, normally we do this in order for us to be able to, uh, first of all, uh, offer alternatives to uh, the current government. And we did that for five years uh, with the PF, and we are going to continue with the UPND. We will continue offering them alternative uh, solutions to the problems which this country has. And if you look at uh, uh, our current situation, uh, one of the key issues we need to deal with is debt. We need to find a way of managing the debt which we have. But at the same time, we need to provide economic growth uh, for, for our people. Meaning uh, this budget should be able to focus on reducing indebtedness, but at the same time, uh, ensuring that especially the, uh, the, the informal sector begins to grow and starts expanding into the formal sector. And also, it simply means also we need to realign our resources to ensure that we put them where they are most effective. We, we can no longer have wastage uh, because we don't have those resources. Uh, but thirdly, also, we need to look at the issue of COVID-19. Uh, we, we, we need to understand that it has already impacted uh, on our economic activities, but also it's impacting also on the social activities of the country. So uh, I'm expecting a budget also that tries to strike a balance to ensure that uh, we provide adequate medical care to our people, 
but at the same time allow the economy to continue the wheels of the economy to continue running yeah. so uh, in a nutshell it should run around uh, those factors yeah. and i want to come back to the alternative budget but before we we get into that maybe we move step by step now crossing over to you um, and of course, I know you are also looking at the welfare of vulnerable people in the community. And some of the things that you also want to see in the 2022 national budget is that uh, there should be a certain percentage that will be channeled to make sure that vulnerables, are also, their livelihood also change because that will play a very important role. What are some of the things that you're expecting the 2021 budget to contain uh, or as context, as we might put it? Okay, so our focus is on uh, the social protection um, budget. So uh, the 2021 um, uh, budget, uh, it was, I think for the past ten, uh, 10 years, usually social protection gets about 2 to 3% of the bu budget expenditure, government expenditure. So we are hoping that uh, with a new government in place and uh, um, with the new rules, because <laughs> they've come in, you know, with so many, you know, uh, stringent uh, restrictions in terms of how uh, government ex as, um, spends on certain on certain things especially with the ministries so we hope that this time the budget will be a little bit um, more and that uh, with whatever will be under the protection uh, budget social protection budget will really benefit our people because if you look at vulnerability vulnerable, vulnerability in zambia it's, it's, it's at a percentage of 60.5 percent which is very high and um, usually it does not go to the ones that are supposed to benefit. You find that the budget has been allocated, but then the ones that are supposed to benefit don't benefit because there's so many, so many issues, uh, especially when it comes to the social caste transfer. Yes, it was introduced. It's a good, you know, it's a good um, program. But then most people, if you go on the ground, it's not everybody that benefits. It's not everybody that, that tends to have a share of this. Or they might have a share, but... You know, during the whole year that they're supposed to receive, you find that they've only received it once or twice. Then where has the money gone? Or where has this, um, you know, portion of, uh, uh, of the cash that is supposed to be for a particular person gone? So we are looking at um, them, of course, increasing uh, the, the, the social cash transfer or the protection budget. Be before protection I shift to, to the vice president, of course, uh, just, just another uh, quick take on, on your side. I know social protection is very key very important aspect there. Compared to the previous government, and I'm looking at the 2020-2021 national budget, of course the 2021 national budget we're still using now yes. until the one which we are waiting to yes. be presented. What are some of the lessons that we can draw from that and improve on as, of course, as we push in recommendation to the government as we await for the 2022 national budget? It's the system. It always goes back to the system. Who is in charge? Who is doing what? Is, is something being done right? And I mean, if um, something is not working, how do you make it better? Because if you look at the social protection, there's an aspect of how people have been receiving funds using, there was an introduction of electronic uh, cash transfer. You go in the rural areas, how many people have, have phones or how many people have internet or how many people really know how to use, use a phone for them to receive that uh, message to say, oh, they're supposed to come, go and get a certain amount. And also the consideration of if you are giving somebody a, a cash transfer or how much allocation are you supposed to give to a household because uh, like in the last budget there was an allocation of 994,000 households that were supposed to benefit who is taking account of this I mean at as at now how many have benefited from the 994 who is going to give us a report at the end of the year that um, 994 really received this amount and if you look at the amounts in, in the budget they indicated 110 kwacha for a household come on millimil is more than 100 kwacha millimil is was about 130 kwacha so you are trying to help a household which probably has five to eight people in, in a household that money is not is not enough so we're looking at the system that will be considerate we're looking at a system that will be that would be more accommodative to, to, the, to the people that are vulnerable. Also looking at different types of vulnerabilities. For us who are even working with people with um, dis disability, you find that it's a parent who has a disability. They can't work. They can't go anywhere. They can't do anything because they're, they're disabled. And if you're looking at a parent who has children uh, who, are, who are disabled, 
they can't go to school. So how how does this parent, you know, help these children? It's 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 in so many ways. So it's the system, also the people that are in charge, the ministries that are aligned to these, you know, um, it, uh, expenditures like the social project. Who's in charge? Because you find that you you direct somebody to say, oh, this side, this ministry is giving uh, social cash transfer. They will be told, no, it's not us who are in charge because. Um, another ministry has some allocation. So there's always a confusion of who is supposed to do what. Okay. So I think for us, the interest is the system must be clear, the system must be transparent, and we must know exactly who's, who we're supposed to run back to if things go wrong. And Mr. Mulia, it's good that you are here, and uh, of course you are from the opposition government, and you are taking note of these key pertinent issues. Now, the alternative budget, and I'm looking at the 2022 national budget that will be presented by the new government, of course, through the Ministry of Finance, Dr. Msokotwani, Let's just speak about your alternative budget. What are some of the things that you were prioritizing in the alternative budget? Okay, I think uh, maybe let me uh, start where, where my, my sister has ended. Um, issue of social protection uh, is something that we take very seriously as a party. But I think we have a totally different approach to it from what the rest of the governments have been doing. Because look, uh, there are a number of people, they could be vulnerable, but they are viable. And uh, we need to support them economically other than just giving them a 110 kwacha handout. It's meaningless. So, for example, there are certain jobs which we need to uh, reserve specifically for those people who are vulnerable. For example, a person who is on a wheelchair can work in a, in a booth at a target. Why are we giving able-bodied people those jobs? So for us as a police, as a government, those jobs should be uh, uh, reserved for people who are vulnerable so that they can earn a salary of their own, they can make a budget of their own. We don't want vulnerable people to be made beggars, to be turned into slaves. So one of our policies is to ensure that we economically empower them, not just dish out money to them, because that money will never be enough. So that is uh, just to continue on where uh, my sister ended. But uh, coming to the alternative budget, I think uh, one of the key things we need to look at is how do we raise money first? And also, how do we uh, lessen the burden of the people uh, in terms of uh, on their incomes? So one of the things we need to do is to make some reforms, uh, especially in terms of our revenue collection. We need to expand uh, the, task, the, the tax base. And uh, one of the key things which we propose in our alternative budget is to ensure that um, uh, ZRIA, for example, is given a larger capacity. At the moment, you know, uh, ZRIA is getting leftovers of accountants and big professionals because the multinationals are taking up the, the, the biggest brands. And uh, they are using that to do tax planning, which is preventing ZRI from collecting enough tax. So what we want is to put enough funding into ZRI to start with, mm -hmm. to give them capacity to be able to take on these large multinationals so that they, they will be able to do proper tax mm -hmm. audits there and be able to collect enough money uh, for the Zambian people. So they need to be reformed in the, in the revenue collection. But we think also that uh, there is one sector of the economy which pays more tax than the rest of the sectors, and that is the normal individuals. Uh, if you look at uh, our tax collection, much of it is coming from payers UN, especially if you, cont you, you compare the earnings of individuals uh, from uh, emoluments and you compare it to the taxes that uh, individuals are paying, you find that they are taking the larger uh, burden of, of tax. And uh, our proposal, even in the, in the current alternative budget, the 2021 alternative budget, was that uh, we need to raise the, the tax exempt amount to 6,000 kwacha. But also we need to uh, reduce the, the, the tax rates and move away from the current uh, progressive tax rates. And instead just come to one flat rate, which is 25%. Now this is important uh, to, to allow, uh, to encourage productivity. You know, the current tax system discourages hard work. It discourages you from excelling. When you excel, you are taxed more. You know, when you are dwanzi and doing nothing, you are not taxed or you are taxed less. We need to encourage people to work hard and earn more money where they can. So what we propose is that everyone should pay, should pay tax at 25 percent and uh, uh, the exempt amount should be taken up so that we allow more people to, to be in the tax-free bands. Mm -hmm. That is going to uh, improve the lives of the people. Mm -hmm. But we also think the current uh, VAT rate of 16 percent is also high. We can also reduce that to 14 percent because uh, you understand whenever you are buying uh, commodities you are paying that 16 percent. And that adds on to the prices of goods and services. So what we believe is that uh, uh, the VAT rate needs to, uh, to drop down to about 14% so that we, we allow uh, uh, people to have reduced cost of living. 
In addition, we also think uh, we need to reform the, the VAT uh, 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 scheme on mines. Uh, currently, uh, uh, the exports of these minerals are, uh, are zero rated. We need to take them to standard rate so that we even avoid that issue of VAT refunds, which we've been crying about all the time that uh, the, the, the government is owing the mines, the government is owing the mines. Let us standard rate so that we are able to collect VAT on those exports. Mm. You, you know, uh, when we introduced the zero rating of those exports, the idea was to, uh, to, to increase our, our manufacturing base, but mining is not manufacturing. The prices of, of the mining commodities are determined out there on the international market. Why can't we benefit yeah. from those prices? Yeah. You see? Yeah, just, 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 to, just, just, just to cut you. I know, I know there's so many things that we're going to be looking into step by step, yeah. of course. And uh, that's very important so that people can digest a bit from that point. But just looking at the inclusiveness from your sector in particular, we have seen a deterioration of uh, people with disability being included in the decision-making process. Looking at the budget in focus, uh, do you think there will be inclusiveness in terms of allocation of funds, in terms of people living with disabilities? Will they have a benefit from the 2022 national budget? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what we want to see. It's always on paper. These things are written on paper. We have policies in place that uh, have indicated to say people with disabilities must be included. It's, it's there. The, the documents are there. But do we see this being implemented? is what's one thing that we, we, we want to see. We want to actually see someone, two or three people in parliament that are people with disabilities. We want to see a councillor, we want to see an MP who's, who, who has a disability representing the youth, representing the people that are in the communities. That's the inclusion we're talking about. The policies say you must include them. If you talk about the way you're talking about uh, employment, if you talk about employment, um, companies are mandated to, um, to employ 10% of their employees must be people with, with disabilities. Do we have such in these companies? Who is responsible for making sure that uh, people with disabilities are employed? We have to see, we have to make sure that these things are being done. So it's just being talked about. We want to actually see the actual thing done. And we want the government to make sure that if they include it, if it's in the education sector, sector if it's in the if it's in the health sector, we want uh, teachers with disabilities because we actually have pupils, if you, if you talk about education, we have pupils that need to go to school, but they can't be enrolled into school because there's no expert teacher in a, in a particular school who knows how to do sign language. There's no expert teacher who knows how to read <coughs> Braille. There's no expert teacher who knows how to, um, who is actually somebody that is going through what the young people with disabilities are going through or the schools themselves are not even being accommodative because the, the young people who have wheelchairs can't go into school. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Education was given money to, to, to make sure that these schools are accommodative, that teachers are employed. If you go to the health sector, you find that uh, people with disabilities, are, they, must, they must be given materials when they go to the clinic if they have a particular, certain, uh, a particular disability. They must be given a free service. Do they get the service? No. You find there's, a, there's some system where before you go to the, to, the, to the clinic, you have to register, you must have a card. And these are people who are vulnerable. First of all, they are not informed. They don't know where to start from. Nobody has told them, okay, for you as a person who has disability, you have the right to get a free education or you have the right to go to this. But the system does not allow them. They don't know anything. There's no information uh, as, as to say. So we want to see where every ministry, be it health, be it education, be it agriculture, be it human development, people with disabilities must be included at all sectors. Yeah. No one must be left yeah. behind. You're watching uh, the 2020 National Budget Overview. And of course, in the studio, uh, the guest that I'm having is Mwenya Yambayamba, of course, project coordinator for Barefeet Theatre Organization. And of course, uh, Mr. Mlea, Vice President of uh, Patriots for Economic Progress. We're going to take a short break. and we come back, of course, we'll be diving into detailed conversation in regards to the National Budget. We'll be right back shortly.
Welcome back. If you have just joined us, you're watching the 2020 National Budget Overview on Live TV. And of course, we're having a conversation around the budget. And of course, as we are with the 2022 National Budget, so much expectation from the citizenry point of view as well as stakeholders. And of course, today I'm privileged to be joined by, of course, Mr. Mulea, Pres Vice President for PEP. Patches for Economic Progress, as well as uh, Moenya, of course, coming in from Barefield Theatre Organization. She's a project coordinator. Let's continue from where we left off. Now, um, Mr. Malaya, one particular aspect we cannot run away from is that Zambia has got a debt in play, of course, 12 billion, according to the information that we are receiving. Maybe it could be more, but we say 12 billion as what has been published to the Zambian people. How will this budget, the 2022 budget, be affected by that debt? Um, obviously, it's, uh, it's going to have a, a serious bearing. It's going to have a serious bearing. But um, I, I keep on saying this country has got more potential than the problems that we talk about. And uh, what we need is to change our attitude. And uh, I, should, I should be quick to say that I'm a bit disappointed with the attitude of the, current, the new government because we are back into the complaining attitude. Uh, you know, we've got gold here. We've got uh, uh, emeralds here. We've got... Uh, copper, we've got all the water that we have. Uh, what we need uh, as we go into this budget is to ask ourselves a question. Where can we invest our money so that it starts repaying? You know, we can't be focusing just on crying on how much we are owing. Yes, we owe, but we need to pay back. And how do we pay back? It's by putting the money where uh, it matters most. And uh, we shouldn't just be talking about our external debt. There is some, uh, especially uh, domestic areas, which we don't talk about. And uh, domestic areas, as at 20, 20, end of 2020, they were standing at, at about 24 billion kwacha. That is money which we are owing to our own people here locally, the people who supply, supplied goods and services to government. And what that does is that it, uh, government is holding on to money, which we can use to multiply and even raise enough money to be able to, to pay the external debt. So for me, what I'm expecting, even as we are looking at the external debt, the government should prioritize uh, the, the, the internal uh, debt, especially the domestic areas, the money that they owe to contractors. Because once that money is given to the contractors, it's going to be reinvested in the businesses locally here in Zambia. But what it's going to do also is that it's going to expand demand locally. You know, if, if I'm a construction contractor, you give me 10 million kwacha today. I'm going to, be, to buy tomatoes there at, at the market. I'm going to ask a metal fabricator there to supply me with some windows and, and, and the like. And that money will, will have a multiplier effect in the economy. So the starting point is uh, when we talk about debt, let's not forget the domestic areas which we owe to people. But secondly, I think in terms of for us to be able to deal with the, the, the external debt which we have, we need to now start refocusing our productivity on those sectors that can quickly start bringing money to us. And one of the key areas is agriculture. And uh, in agriculture, I think the current model of the farmer input support program has failed. We know we've had it for many years. People produce bumper harvest, but we've never taken them out of poverty. So what we think ourselves as, as Petros for Economic Progress is that uh, the, the, the government should uh, immediately start setting up uh, methodologies of creating a market for our farmers. Our farmers are capable of producing. But every time they produce, they don't know where to take their crops. So immediately what uh, I would advise the current government is immediately start speaking to people in the region so that we identify where the gaps are. For example, the DRC, you're able to sell a bag of maize there for about 400 uh, kwacha, and yet here it's selling at 150 kwacha. Why don't we explore that market through a, bi a bilateral uh, uh, agreement and we allow our farmers to take the maize there? But let's not just talk about maize. Our potential is immense. We can still talk about other crops. So for me, I think the government needs to invest in expanding the market for agricultural produce. But also we need to leverage our gold. We have gold now here. We need to realign our policies and leverage the gold. It, it can be able to, to, to pay back. But also, our copper prices from the time that we borrowed money have doubled. So for me, I think this debt crisis we are trying to put ourselves on is just a matter of attitude. Copper is now at, at over $10,000 uh, per metric ton. That is double the amount it was selling at the time we borrowed. Why are we failing to pay? It is because our policies in the mining uh, sector are, are flawed. 
we need to relook at them and realign them so that we are able to benefit from these uh, good copper prices. Mm. And the projections are that copper is going to double again. I, I think in the next four or five years, copper prices will be around twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars per metric ton. So for me, I think it's, it's, we shouldn't be panicking. We should be looking at uh, how can we be innovative with the potential that we have? How can we be innovative with the resources that we have? So I think we need to stop being cry babies mm -hmm. and uh, fold our slips yeah. and get and to work. I, I like the fact that you have uh, ma made mention to say that copper prices have been improving or significantly. If you look at the 2019, 2020, copper prices are about 5,500 metric tons. Uh, to the end of 2020, the 2020 there, you had about uh, 6,500 6, per metric ton. Yeah. So the improvement is there, and this is something that we can ex uh, exploit as a country to make sure that it's value for money. Yes. Okay, great. Moving on to, to, to you, Amwenya. Now, particularly, I'm looking at in terms of um, the president's speech at the opening of parliament. He did emphasize on different key aspects. And one of the things that came in, in terms of diversifying the economy was agriculture, which was put an emphasis on. Now, I'm looking at from your sector. Of course, you deal with people with disabilities. How would you want maybe these sectors to accommodate people living with disabilities? It goes back, it takes me back to the social protection. And social protection is about human development. So uh, they must make sure that they help people to develop themselves. Like he said earlier, that we should run away from the fact that people must be given. Even, even as we work with uh, people with, uh, who are vulnerable, we also talk to them about how they should not always have the mindset of charity thinking, you know, model of uh, charity thinking all the time. They must make sure that whatever they can do, they should do it mm. to improve. So whatever they're given, they should try and improve it. So if you're talking about uh, uh, the agriculture sector, it takes us back to the social cash transfer, where the government must allocate at least enough money to be able to give to people who are in the rural areas, vulnerable people in the rural areas, that are able to, to farm or to, 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 you know, to just be given the opportunity that they can do something mm. with the money in terms of agriculture, they can plant something yeah. and also uh, look at look at it in different uh, types of the country. If, if, if Eastern province can produce, you know, um, good uh, groundnuts, let them invest, let the farmers invest in that. So for the vulnerable people, if they're given the social constructor, if they, they are given, they are given an opportunity to come up with a cooperative, let them think of a creative way or an idea that will be able to, to invest that money into that so that it builds up and so that they can be able to help themselves and not always depend on government so that every year they should expect they're given yeah. something. But yeah. whenever they're given something, if it's something to do with agriculture, let them put it into the agriculture. If it's something to, to do with mining, because now I understand there's even uh, cooperatives that have been given opportunities, young people are given opportunities to go and, you know, to, to, to own mines, small mines. Mm -hmm. Let them, you know, invest that money so that they can, they can continue helping themselves. Mm -hmm. That way, the young people are, are developing themselves yeah. and are growing themselves. So just take, just taking you up back a bit into the 2021 national budget in terms of capacity building for people living with disabilities. How uh, how do you think there was much done then, or do you think maybe there was so much mistakes? Maybe in the new one, maybe we expect in terms of capacity building, maybe there could be institution readily to train uh, people with disabilities and how to farm, for example, how to venture into business. Because moreover, we have a new ministry now which is looking at medium and small businesses. That ministry will be very acute in terms of also including people living with disabilities yes. who are also in businesses. What's your viewpoint in that regard? In that regard, is um, the institutions are there, but they're not enough. And even if they're there, people with disabilities are not enrolled into these institutions. Because, again, like I was saying, there's not so much information of where can I go? Where do I go? Which institution is it? There's no, so, there's no information where even these young people with disabilities in the communities, they're just wondering about. There is need for an institution that will take up the responsibility of informing the people in the communities. Okay, so we have an institution in Lusaka. We have two institutions. Or in Choma, we have two institutions. Or in Dola, we have two institutions that are looking at uh, in, enrolling young people with disabilities so they can come and learn, mm -hmm. so that they, you know, they improve their capacity in terms of entrepreneurship and vocational training. There's not so much information. And even if these institutions are there, we still have an issue of the trainers. They'll go at that school, but there's not enough lecturers that are experts in training certain types of people living with disabilities. There's not enough um, resources to actually 
be able to give these people a full well training because they go to school there's no material to train there's no material to use if they're maybe teaching them um you know simple things like making bedding or beds or making chairs the machines are are not there so even if i go to school as a person learning with a disability how do i go to school how will yeah, i yeah. how will you you yeah. know improve on my on my skill yeah. because i need to have something to make sure that I get trained. Yes, the lecture will be there, but if there's no materials for me to, to get trained, then I'll just learn theoretically, mm. and you know, I won't, I'll go out there still not knowing so much, mm. meaning you are limiting me. So all these things must be put in consideration. If we allocate money to a particular ministry or to, to a particular sector, it must be in full force. Mm. And if you're going to say, to, to have a target, can we make sure that that target is met we don't want when you when you when you allocate money to a particular ministry only ten okay. half the yeah. percentages. Yeah. Then where is the other money going? So what yeah. we want is full force and make sure that these things are implemented according to the way the budget has been allocated. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Mulea, yes. and, and I know you're taking note of this, yeah. and I just want to shift to your alternative budget. Yeah. Is it something that you're also considering in your alternative budget in terms of meeting those standards? Yeah, look, um, uh, when you are talking about a budget like the one we're expecting, you are trying to uh, express your ideas and your plans into money. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there are a lot of reforms that need to be made around uh, uh, what we do. Uh, first of all, I, 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 I'll start from a social protection point of view. You know, the, the, the charity social protection will go out if we can give social protection which is economically driven. And uh, I want to agree with, uh, uh, with my sister here. Uh, one of the things we need to do is also to reform, uh, as we go into the budget, put money there for the reformation of our education system. Uh, when I was in primary school, we used to have uh, woodwork in, in primary school. Uh, I don't think there's any school doing woodwork. We actually did that school. as well. <laughs> yes, yes. You see, they were, so you become a carpenter as early as the age of 10. You see, you, you, you start training to be a carpenter. So I think we need to become a bit more practical. Uh, I, I, I run a construction company, and I can tell you the skills levels in this country are very low. Every time that you hire people, you need to start training them. You see, so the education system, first of all, needs, we need to invest money into it, even in this budget. We start that reform where the education should become more practical. You know, we are not yet at the level of the UK for all of us to be doing business studies. And, and it's a mistake we made. We can have some elements of entrepreneurship in our, in our curriculum, but I think we need to do more practical courses. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got cell phones all over the country. There's no single school in Zambia teaching people how to repair cell phones. Can you imagine that? So th that's, those are the reforms I think we need to invest money in, to be able to allow a child who graduates from grade 12 to be able to repair a cell phone, to be able to repair a computer. Mm -hmm. And then when they go into college, they will be able to manufacture mm -hmm. a cell phone. It's they great that you have mentioned that point. Yeah. Sorry to yeah. cut you short. So the new ministry, the, the ministry which I've been introduced, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Felix Mutati, uh, the innovation and technology, um, science and research, very important ministry. Do you think, now I wanted to ask you in terms of funding, and, and as you are responding, probably you can tackle that aspect because it falls under that ministry in terms of making sure the capacity build is given to people with what is happening in the country, with the potential ability in terms of the business uh, that is happening around. How would the funding, do you think we'll be borrowing more as a country? So I'm, I'm asking you too many questions. <laughs> no, no, no problem. For me, I think if you can even extend the program yeah. to two, three hours. <laughs> I'm at the service of yeah. the country yeah. so that uh, we, can, we can share. Look, I, I think for me, first of all, I, I may sound a bit controversial, but I think it was not necessary to create uh, that ministry uh, because it will not work for as long as the education system has not been reformed. Our attitude is wrong. You see, the, 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 the raw material which, are, which is available is wrong. So this minister and his ministry, uh, we are creating just a place where people can, can earn salaries. For me, I think the money which is, which, which is supposed to be allocated to this ministry should have been taken to the Ministry of Education to reform the way we train our children, the way we train our, our scholars, so that by five years from now, we are producing people that can feed into that ministry. It doesn't even need to exist. The attitude and the mindset of the people will create that ministry. It comes to the same as what we've done for the so-called Ministry for Small and Medium Industries. There's already Ministry of Commerce which is already a small and medium industry ministry. We are just replicating. Now, understand me here. There is a definition for a small and medium industry. And we are talking about businesses of up to about 50 million kwacha being considered there. 
Uh, for us as a party, we think they should have created the means for the informal sector. It could have made a difference on the SME ministry. We leave the Ministry of Commerce doing what it does. Then introduce a specific ministry for the informal sector so that we develop capacity in the informal sector and transit those people slowly into the formal sector. So the Ministry of uh, Technology, a good idea, but misplaced, coming at the wrong place. It, it's, it's like uh, you, you, you are bringing a bucket to a tap which does not have water. You understand? There's nothing that is feeding into that ministry. So we are, we are beginning to build a house from the roof, other than building a house from the foundation. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think, scrap that ministry and let the whole budget allocation be sent to the Ministry of Education. And then you create a department in the Ministry of Education for, for science and technology, specifically to look at implementing the syllabus for science and technology into the school. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, where are you going to get the people yeah. to join Mr. Mutati's yeah. ministry? Just one last They're question. Just one last question yes. that probably did not receive any feedback on. Yeah. Is do we see uh, or, uh, another extension of borrowing from our point of view as a country? Looking at the fact that also the president uh, on BBC did indicate to say that he has inherited an empty treasury. Do we see borrowing in order to channel to uh, different sectors and money to different sectors? Yes, yes, because this has been the attitude of the UPND actually from the time they were in opposition. And uh, we were accused of uh, attacking our fellow opposition at the time when the UPND was, uh, was in, uh, in opposition. But we had one key difference actually for, with both the PF and the UPND, and it's the issue of borrowing. This country cannot be developed through borrowing. We need to look inside ourselves. The UPND, the first pronouncement they made is that they're going to the IMF. So clearly, borrowing is not stopping. We are still on the same path that where PF left, UPND is picking it up and going there. And, and we think that is not the right thing to do. Let's put an end to the IMF program for now. Let's come back and look inside ourselves and say, what can we do with the opportunities which are existing internally here? Mm -hmm. I can tell you, just the land that we have is good capital for our people to, to receive foreign direct investment. We don't need to borrow anything. What, all we need is empower our people with land and with a policy that says an investor who is coming here needs to allocate about 20, 30, 40 percent of their uh, shares to a Zambian who is going to provide the land. We don't need to be selling land to foreigners. Why are we doing that? Why are we uh, demarcating our, our land to the foreigners? All foreigners should invest on our land owned by a Zambian. So we have a potential to raise money. And with copper prices going, going up and with uh, electric cars coming on board, we need quickly to start uh, setting a base for companies to come here and start making the batteries for these uh, uh, electric cars using our land. We don't need to even provide any money. Provide the land mm -hmm. and provide our people there with a bit of knowledge there on business entrepreneurship and uh, on, on technology. Put them there. And then they go into joint ventures with foreign companies which can come now with the money. Yeah. The copper is here. We yeah. don't need to export it. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need to export it. Okay. Uh, as we are winding up, uh, of course, time is not always friendly. Um, just a quick intel on what is really happening. I know you are in direct contact with people living with disabilities. When it comes to them having a, a conducive environment to do their businesses, to operate in in, in, in short terms, uh, how is the environment now? It's not conducive because it's not accommodative and it's not that inclusive. Like I said, everything is written on paper, but it's not what it is when you go on the ground. So it's, it's just that the people, the, the government or the society must embrace people with disabilities, must understand that those people also need to live and they must be empowered or they must, they must begin to, to involve them and engage them. And that's one thing that we're lacking, inclusion. There's no inclusion. If you look at even the, the setup in the communities, you find you, I don't know if, if even if you walk in the streets, you'll find maybe two or three shops that are owned by a person with disability. First of all, they're being discriminated. They can't be given, they can't be given, first of all, they're not given opportunity to go to school. They're not given opportunity to, to get uh, employed. Only a few, I think, companies that I know of, um, this uh, supermarket. Yeah, that uh, we can probably we can also. Yeah, <laughs> they 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 are the yeah. only ones I've seen that are that are employing uh, people with disabilities. What about the, the other rest of the the, the the supermarkets? What about the the other companies? Why can't they include these people? So the environment is not conducive and it's not accommodative. So we want an environment where we can see young people living with disability 
taken to school, come out of school and be employed and be given opportunities. Mm. It's all about opportunity and human development. That's what we're talking about. So the environment is not that, that mm. conducive. We just want to see these people being included in everything, social activities and social development. Yeah. And your last remarks to viewers who are watching in regards to the Twenty International Budget and many things that <laughs> Bearfield Theatre is actually focusing on. Yes, um, really, uh, we just hope for the better, and uh, we hope that whatever is being said uh, uh, by the new government that is that is in place, they should fulfill it and make sure that they say they walk the talk. I mean, promise people what you promise them, and don't do the opposite. That's the only way. I mean, you can get support, and this is what we want to see. We want to see vulnerable people, especially children living on the streets, we want to see recreational facilities created for them. We want to see schools being empowered to make sure that they accommodate all these people. And that's what we want, that's what we want a society that is inclusive. Thank you so much for coming through. Mr. Mleya, your last remarks uh, on, as we await the 2022 national budget. Yeah, I think my expectation is that uh, overall this should be an investment uh, budget. Uh, it should not be consumptive. Uh, we can reduce uh, the amount of uh, uh, money that we put into consumptive uh, expenditure and put it into uh, investment. And uh, we also need to look inwards. I think this attitude of, uh, of foreign, foreign also needs to be killed. And uh, we start uh, realizing that uh, there can't be development if we don't develop ourselves because uh, you can only do that which is within your reach. And we have a lot of uh, competitive advantage. Uh, as I said, we, we, we hold about 40% of the water in the southern uh, region. We've got more than 20 national parks here. We've got more than 10 waterfalls. There's no country endowed with so much uh, resources like that. But we also have a young population. And uh, I would like the, uh, to urge the Minister of, of Finance to ensure that much of the investment is in the young people. Because 10 years from now, we are going to have uh, uh, adults who are empowered, adults who have been invested in, who are uh, tycoons. We want to, to make our own billionaires here in Zambia uh, We are who are running multinational companies. Of course, we have two, about two multinational companies, but that's not enough after more than 50 years of independence. So I think my expectation is that uh, uh, we need to have um, a people-focused budget, and uh, please, no excuses. We don't want excuses. We don't want more. We want more time. No. Yeah. Your time is now. Five years is counting. So there's nothing like give us more time. We need to start working now. Yeah. Mr. Amleya, thank you so much for coming to the program. Thank you. Uh, Madam Yambayamba, thank you so much for coming to the program. It has been great having you on the platform. I think it was very insightful. You have been watching the 2022, 2021, 2022 parody national budget on live TV. And of course, I've been your host in Danji. And next time, of course, I'll be having extended uh, conversation with various stakeholders just to see what, in, in particular, from their lens, what they actually expect, what are their recommendations, what are their predictions in regards to the 2022 national budget awaiting presentation by the Minister of Finance, Dr. Msokotwani. Uh, hopefully, sooner or later, we'll be seeing uh, those policy directions through that budget. Thank you so much for watching. It's bye-bye. On behalf of the entire production team, it's God bless.